Hi. We're going to talk about smart output iterators. I'm going to show you what that is, how that can be useful, and uh, I'd love to get your feedback. Okay. So to understand what that is, um, we're going to need an introduction. So let's go back to something very basic, which is applying a function. So a function takes an input, produces an output, and that's something we know how to do in C++. This is something that's deeply embedded in the core language. What's not so much embedded is applying a function on a collection of elements. Hi. Taking a collection of inputs, producing a collection of, a collection of outputs, that's not something that's as deeply embedded as the core language, as um, applying a function on just a finite set of element is. Um, so to go around that, the STL uh, operates on iterators, there's small components that move along a uh, collection, um, so that a function um, can operate on one or two input iterators and produce some, something through an output iterator. And that brings us back to applying a function to an input and producing an output, right? Okay. So this is how the, the SDL is designed. So the function where the logic happens is the algorithm, like the SDL algorithms, and the inputs come in the form of a begin and an end iterator of a range. And when the, when the algorithm produces a collection of outputs, it goes through an output iterator. Right, so this is the sort of algorithm and output iterator I'm talking about. So these guys are the input iterators, this guy is the output iterator, and that is the algorithm. In the STL, all the logic is concentrated in the algorithm, in the function. The algorithm is smart and the iterators are dumb. What do I mean by that? Um, what's smart in, is in, in an algorithm is that the algorithm carries the logic. What sort of logic? It can be like applying a function, for example, with transform, or checking for a predicate with copy if, or doing something more complicated like set difference, for example. So What's in, the, or what's in orange is the logic, and the rest is just talking with the input and output iterators. So the iterators don't do much. They have two basic responsibilities, um, plus plus and dereferencing. And in the iterators of the STL, most of them um, would move one step forward when incremented and, and just give the reference to whatever they're pointing to. So that's the STL as it is today. Now, what if the logic was somewhere else? What if it was in, in, in the I input side, in the iterator? That's how ranges adapters operate. So by ranges, I'm, I'm talking about ranges libraries, such as range v3, for example. Um, that looks like that. So we've got um, inputs here, numbers, and they are assembled with uh, these adapters, filter and transform. And those guys, they plug onto a range, for example, a vector here, and they um, wrap the iterator so that to embed uh, behavior and logic in the iterator, right? And those guys come in the algorithm. These are input iterators, okay? So that's how ranges adapters uh, uh, manipulate collections. The iterator is smarter than the, the native uh, standard iterator in uh, that when you increment it, it doesn't just move one step forward. It would do something uh, more elaborate, like checking for a predicate and moving until it finds something that satisfies that predicate. Um, even though it doesn't have to be um, completely customized, like for filter, dereferencing doesn't do more than giving a reference to whatever it's pointing to. Same thing with transform, that doesn't do anything special with incrementing, but that does something special when dereferencing. It applies a function, which, which is the logic yeah, that used to be in the transform algorithm. Right? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> what if 
we put the logic on the output iterator. So that would make smart output iterator. And now we can actually start the presentation. So hi, I'm Jonathan Bukhara. I run the Fluent C++ blog, which is a blog focused on expressive code in C++ with an article on every Tuesday and Friday morning. And I also work at Murex as a team lead of a C++ software developers team. What keeps me up at night is um, searching how to write expressive code in C++, which has a lot of aspects. One of them is studying the STL, which also has a lot of aspects. And one, one of them is fo focusing on the output iterators, and in particular, on smart output iterators. So we're going to focus on, on, on those guys, right, and, and see how we can put some logic in them and, and why it would be useful. Part one of that presentation is seeing what kind of things we can put, it makes sense to put into an output iterator. We're going to see uh, several examples um, split into two categories. The first one will be um, logic that has to do with communicating with the output container, and then things that would relieve some of the complexity inside of the algorithms. Right, so let's start with uh, those that talk to the containers. There's one smart output iterator that's already in the standard library, which is back in SATA. So we're going to go through that one and, and, then, and then other ones that are not standard and uh, see if that's useful. So just to make sure we're in line, the, uh, the most basic thing you can put into an output iterator is probably an iterator coming from a standard container, right? So we've got an input here and uh, copy overrides uh, the output, right? Now, if I replace that with a back inserter, so back inserter, when you pass it something, it doesn't just Send, sends it through to the container, it would uh, call it pushback on a container it's bound to, right? So that's back in SATA, so it's going to call pushback every, for every um, member of the numbers collection. We're going to see how back in SATA is implemented. The reason why we're going to get into that code is that we will take inspiration to implement our own uh, smart output iterators. So how do we do back inserter? Well, what do we need back inserter to do? So this is a implementation of std copy, right? Which is probably the simplest algorithm there is. So std copy needs to um, iterate over the input collection, yeah, and uh, assign the input values to the output by dereferencing it, and then uh, applying the assignment operator and then incrementing. So we've got these three steps, right, that back hint data has to somehow um, fit with. So we're going to see how to implement those uh, operations. So back in SATA, uh, it's a function actually that returns an iterator that's called back insert iterator. And it has to somehow be connected with the container we, we, we pass it, right? So let's say we keep a reference to that container. Now, the dereferencing operator is where the trick is. Um, because for like the begin of a vector, uh, dereferencing returns a reference to the element of the collection. Back inserter doesn't do that. It returns itself to stay in the game. So that when we call the assignment operator, we're actually talking to back insert iterator. Okay? And this is where we can put some logic, like push back here. And then we increment it, but there's not much to do there. So we just implement it and, and don't do anything in it. Right, so that's back inserter. There's another one that's called inserter that doesn't call pushback but insert. There's something a bit particular with it. If you look at it, you, you, you pass the um, output collection, obviously, but also the position where you want to insert, which makes a lot of sense if you'd like to insert in a vector, but which doesn't make as much sense if you'd like to insert in, in a sorted collection, like a set, for example. 
right? Because when you insert into a set, well, the set is a sorted collection, so it's its job to know where to put what you're passing in. If you happen to know where to pass it, you can uh, save some, some time. But if you don't know, like in this case, we have no idea where to insert in the set. It's just bizarre to write that, because we have to pass something. Uh, we can pass begin or end. doesn't mean much. It won't help. And it's, it's a hint, yeah. Probably not a good one, and uh, may actually be detrimental to performance uh, in that case. In some cases, it is. Um, it's not the topic of today. But let's, uh, as an exercise, implement an output iterator that does the same thing as inserter, but without taking the hint, because it would know that it's on a sorted collection. Right? So we would um, follow the same model as back in SATA, right? So bind on the container to output to and stay in the game for during dereferencing de and don't do anything for incrementing and do the logic in the assignment operator, right? In SATA. We could also implement um, one with a hint, okay? Um, not showing the code here, uh, but I show, uh, at the end of the presentation, I give you the GitHub where you can find all the code here. Right, uh, so what can we do with that sort of logic? Well, imagine that you'd like to send data somewhere that for some reason doesn't uh, have the, um, like, an STL compliant interface. Like, imagine you've got a legacy collection, for example. Right, a bizarre interface uh, coming from old code uh, that has the semantics of a collection, but not really the interface that goes along with it. Right, it would be a shame not to use the STL algorithms just because of that interface. So how about making some sort of a, an adapter, right, in the output iterator? Let's call that custom inserter, so that we would let it know how to insert in 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 that thing, right, the dark legacy thing. So we've got an input, um, that thing, which is sort of the output. And so let's write an output iterator where to, to which we can explain how to um, add stuff, right, to the, the output collection. Okay. Same pattern. Bind with the container stay in the game, don't do anything for incrementing, and do the logic in the assignment operator. Right, seeing a pattern here. Okay, um, there's this use case that comes up every so often, I find, um, which is imagine you've got a map and you'd like to insert new data in it. Right, so there may be something already in the map. If you'd like to insert something in a map, um, well, if, if the key you're trying to insert is already in the map, you've got essentially two options with the SDL. One is don't do anything, and the second one is replace the value that's already there. It's useful sometimes to somehow aggregate the value which you're passing in with the one that's already there, right? So, the output iterator is, um, would be at the right position to handle that, right? So the interface we'd like to write is say, OK, we're going to start with um, an empty map and send in two batches of data. And, and you can see that there are some keys in common between the two batches of data. So sending in the first batch, well, we don't really need to have um, an aggregating logic because there's nothing yet in, in the map. So we can just send in with an inserter or rather sorted inserter to be more concise. Right, um, so at this point, result has the data that's in the first batch. Now, wouldn't it be nice to be able to send the second batch and explain that, uh, well, if you find some existing keys, here is how to aggregate the values. So let's go and implement that. Well, there's nothing really new. Uh, just bind to the output, the map. Um, keep track of how to aggregate things. 
um, stay in the game for dereferencing, don't do anything for incrementing, and do the logic in the uh, assignment operator. And the logic is uh, not that difficult. It's, it's just, is it there? Well, if it's there, I aggregate it. If it's not, I just insert it normally. Okay. Right. And that last one, DevNor, I'm going to show you the implementation of that. This is it. Okay, so that's smart output iterators. It has all the tricks, staying in the game, don't do anything with incrementing. Um, now, let's use it. Okay, algorithm. Um, what do you guys think that does? It does yeah, exactly. It does nothing. Now, how do you think that can be useful? Yeah, I understand. That's true. Yeah. Whether that's a side effect of Apple, I don't know. Absolutely, it has a side effect. Ben? It saves you from using a condition at the point of recall. At the point at the point of what? At the point of recall. It saves you from using a condition. You just you were somewhere down in the code, you had this thing passed in from up above. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. Like your code. Cool. Yeah. It lets you on uh, algorithms that have two output iterators. If you don't care about one of the outputs, you can use this to grab the output. So yeah, great. Like partition copy set. Yeah, exactly. So that would be useful if we have an algorithm that has several outputs and to send one to voids. And one example of, uh, well, it's actually the only one in the SDL that has several outputs is partition copy. Right? So partition copy is an algorithm that takes um, an input range, pick an end a predicate, and um, two output iterators, and it would send the data that satisfies the predicate to the first one, and the data that doesn't satisfy the predicate to the other one. Right? Does that seem reasonable? Isn't that... Except you just use the regular copy if. Yeah. Copy if. Yeah. Yeah, it's a more elaborate way to do copy if, so is it really useful? Nah. Well... Case, it might be yeah. I, I can't say that might not be in this, in this case, but... Yeah. Well, in the SDL, there's just one that has several outputs, this, this one, but it doesn't mean that conceptually that it can be others. There's several outputs, there's this one, but it doesn't mean that conceptually that it can be others. Um, like, Going back to algorithms on, on sets, um, what we have in the STL is set difference. Uh, so set difference, or the algorithm on set, they take, they take sets, which means in that context, sorted collections. Um, so they all take two collections, say A and B. Set difference, we turn the elements that are in A, not in B. Set intersection, the elements that are in A and in B, with the versions coming from A. Um, set symmetric difference, uh, the elements that are in A, not in B, and the elements that are in B and not in A, and set union returns everything. But there's no such thing as an algorithm that would return the three sides uh, in separate outputs. But that could be useful. Like a use case for that, like a typical use case for that is, imagine you've got two versions of your collection. Like you've got collection, which is the before state, and another one which is the after state. And you'd like to know what's been removed, what's been added, and what's been modified, right? This is, that sort of algorithm could do that in one single pass, okay? And in the case where you'd, you'd care, say, only about oh, that part and that part and that part, you wouldn't care about it, well, you can send that away into your DevNor iterator, right? So that's one example. Okay, I have a use case of that. Were well, you thinking you about could, something else? If you, had, if you had this algorithm, you could implement all four of the previous ones. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd repeat the comment. So uh, if we had such an algorithm, we would um, be able to implement all the other ones with that. Alistair? Another example, if I've got three iterators, I could consume an entire stream and throw it away. Price. Yeah. So the comment is if we had a stream, we could consume the stream and then throw it away. Yeah. 
<laughs> spaceship. <laughs> okay, so the comment was we could call that a spaceship operator. <laughs> Question at the back? No, it's just okay. Right, let's move on. So we've just seen those guys uh, that all have in common that they communicate with the output in the general sense of it. But I think that output iterators can be conceptually um, separated into two parts. That would be the first part, which is concerned with the, the output. And that would be a second part that is more, that, do, that does things that are related to algorithms. So we're going to see some examples of, of um, things that are typically done in algorithms and that could be, sorry, that could be uh, offloaded to an uh, iterator. Right, so let's take uh, the basic example of uh, applying a function to every element of a collection. So that's what std transform does. Let's try to, to move that responsibility of applying a function down to an output iterator. Okay, one possible interface for that would be that you'd have this sort of adapter that would uh, carry a function, okay, and it would be plugged onto an other output iterator, and every piece of data that would come in from the algorithm through times two would be multiplied by two, and the result will be sent on to back in SATA, which will push it back into results. Right? Um, we, um, we could actually do that in one line, but here I've, I've put it on, on two lines, um, uh, define the, that adapter first and then use it because um, it allows to compose uh, those adapters more easily. Okay, so if everyone's clear with the interface, let's have a look at how we can implement that. Question about the interface? Cool. Or oh, same pattern, really. So we need to design this output iterator that knows the function and the other iterator in it to pass on the data to. Right, so we're going to connect it and, and remember them here. Uh, don't do anything with, uh, well, stay in the game with dereference operator. Uh, for increment operator, we don't want to do anything special, but it is connected to an iterator, an underlying iterator. So for the moment, you might as well just um, pass on the increment uh, instruction for that iterator. And the action happens in the assignment operator, and here the, the action is uh, applying a function. Yeah. Now, there's a um, little indirection because We've designed the, the iterator, so the iterator we've just designed is that whole thing, right? But we need to design that, the thing that builds the adapter. So this adapter takes a function, right, remembers that function, and has to somehow has a, have a function called syntax here. Okay? And to make it, um, since, well, this is a, we could probably use a um, uh, template deduction in constructor, but before C++17, we'd have that helper intermediate helper function. So that, that's it for transform. Then we can think about filter and think it's pretty much the same, or it's pretty much the same, except for one thing, uh, which we'll see in the implementation. So the need is the same, have something that would um, um, have a predicate and only send on the data if it satisfies the predicate. Having a look at the implementation, uh, just uh, keep track of everything. Uh, don't do anything special for dereferencing an increment operator. Uh, do the action in the assignment operator. And then it looks okay, doesn't it? But there's something that's bloody complicated about that iterator. It's this bit. 
Well, I suggest that we move on to other examples so that you get a feel of what sort of things we can do with uh, output iterators, and we we get back to that uh, a bit later in that presentation. <laughs> um, so we need that intermediate uh, thing that can build the, the adapter, just like the output transform. That transform filter, things that already existed um, both in algorithms and in ranges adapters. Now, let's do something that's more specific to the output th side of things. So going back to partition copy, right? So part the partition copy, we say that it would um, um, take data and uh, create two branches uh, and, and, and send the data to other, either branch, uh, depending on the predicate. We could try to move, move that logic over to an output iterator. Right? So this output iterator would carry the predicate, obviously, and also two other output iterators to send the data to. Note that for all those underlying iterators, for these examples, is I've just taken back and set up for the sake of simplicity, but that could be um, a transform uh, output iterator or, or a map aggregator or any other output iterator, really. And same thing for the algorithm. I've put copy here for the sake of simplicity, but that could be set difference, for example. It's my favorite algorithm. <laughs> um, right, so um, if everyone's uh, OK with uh, that interface, uh, let's move on to the implementation. Um, it's about the same thing as filter, really. So we keep track of uh, the predicate of the output iterators, uh, stay in the game for the dereferencing operator, for the moment, just increment the output iterators and the lying for the moment and uh, do the action in, in the assignment operator. Okay, and that works. Still need the intermediate thing to build the adapter, the same logic with the uh, function, um, function call operator and uh, or the pre C17 uh, helper. Another case of, of splitting values into two um, with a different, different interface, different way of packing values would be to split the first and the second of a pair, right? So let's say we've got a map up there, okay? Every element in the map is a pair of a key and a value. And Say that we'd like to send the keys to a container of keys and send the values to a container of values, right? Um, that could be a case for output, uh, an output iterate as well. Um, a more generic case will be with a tuple, not just a pair. Mm -hmm. So there's a, an interesting use case here, I think. So it's, it comes down to making a transposition. To see that, imagine that we've got this container, right, a vector of tuples, which represents the lines of a matrix. Okay, so the lines are, the first line is one to three, and then below it's four by six, and so on. If we break that down and, and send the first element of the tool, all, all, all the firsts of all the tuple, tuples into one uh, container, well, the first element of every line would altogether make up the first column. Yes, yeah, so that, that would be the first line here, but now it's three columns. Does everyone see that? Okay. Uh, so that is just a use case, but the general case is to break uh, pairs of tuples uh, into several uh, containers. Well, the implementation is slightly more convoluted, but it's mostly because of um, their addict templates. But the structure is really the same. Uh, note that the dereferencing operator just stays in the game, the increment operator just increments whatever is below, and, and the action happens in the assignment operator. Okay. Um, last one, which is a bit like a generalization of a partition copy, would be demultiplexing. So partition copy, or the output iterator, uh, has two branches. 
How about having any number of branches? Okay, so we would have a function that would somehow decide how to route data over to one output branch. So it's well, the most interesting part is the interface, really, I think. Um, the rest is just code. Well, that's code as well, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, so we've got this simple input, input numbers from 1 to 10, um, and we'd like to send those numbers off to three containers based on some sort of predicate, right? So for the sake of the example, let's say that uh, we've got a predicate on integers, uh, like being a multiple of three, so that would be three, six, and nine, okay, and, and being uh, only a multiple of two and not of three, so that would be two, four, eight, and ten, and then the multiples of one, which is every number, but only one, so that's the rest, so one, five, and seven. Okay. One possible interface that is that one. So we, we've got, we start with um, any algorithm, say suit copy, and it sends the data to that. Okay, and that output iterator carries the branches okay so in this case it takes three branches on three lines every branch has two things a predicate like being a multiple of three and an output iterator okay everyone's okay with that interface cool so now let's uh, let's see the code or we can discuss it after, afterwards. I'm more than happy to have feedback. That's the whole point of it, really. Um, OK, so uh, I hope you can all read that. Okay, so <laughs> over there, no, I'm joking. We're not going to get into that. I mean, I'm happy to talk about that afterwards. But it's mainly the same structure, uh, except there's a lot of, uh, yeah, variadic templates and stuff. But that's the same idea, right? This code uh, makes that interface work. Right, and you have it at the end on the GitHub if you want to play around with it. Oh, happy to talk about that too. Um, right, so we've um, been hovering on that side. Okay, we've seen uh, examples of responsibilities that we could put on onto the output iterator. Could be two sort of things. One would be communicate, uh, ease the integration. To the output container, and the other one will be to take some of the complexity off of the algorithm. Now, a natural question is is it better to put the complexity in the output, or in the input, or in the algorithm? Where should we put it? And that's part two. We're going to see several ways to think about that. One would be design, um, like examining every of those, each of those three places and see their advantages and drawbacks for bearing the complexity. Um, then the terrible problem of incrementing a smart iterator. And then comparing performance. Right? So let's start with uh, design. Um, although most uh, simple thing probably today is the algorithm. So what are the advantages and drawbacks of putting the complexity inside of the algorithm? Well, for one thing, the algorithm has uh, our, our standards, right? I'm saying mostly standard because it depends on your version of C++ because some of them have been added to C++ 11, 17, 20 and so on. Um, but it's still quite standard because for most of them, um, even if you don't have them, it's quite easy to grab an implementation on the internet and paste it in your code and, uh, and you can use it. Like, say, for example, in, if you happen to be in C++ 98 ooh, uh, and, and you don't have copy for all of or that kind of thing, there's nothing easier than to go on the internet and, and grab an implementation, paste it in your code and off you go, you can use them. So most of them you can use. And um, everyone knows them. Right, everyone should know them. I don't know if everyone knows every algorithm, but there's one thing for sure, is that you, you don't have to uh, refrain yourself from using them 
by fear of someone not understanding that. Right? I think we have to level up the algorithms and not the other way around. Right? So the algorithms are extremely standard. You can use them. They're, they are already in your code. One of their drawbacks, though, is that they are hard to compose. By that, I mean that if you'd like to perform two algorithms on the same collections in a row, it's a lot of code to write. You need to, to create an intermediary uh, container and, and write like five lines of code to say transform then filter. Right. Now, moving to the uh, input side of things, which would be implemented with the range adapters. Um, well, they are composable, and that's a huge win. And what's more, they're composable with a very nice syntax, right? With a pipe syntax, with a, uh, that nice semantics that looks really pretty, I think. Um, also, they work pretty well with algorithms that have several inputs. What I mean that by that is that if you take any algorithm that has several inputs, say set difference, for example, set difference takes two sets. Yeah. Now, imagine you'd like to um, say apply a function on one of the inputs and 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 send that to the algorithm. There's nothing easier than using ranges for that because you can um, take the input, pipe it uh, through a transform, and send that thing to set difference, right? Without without um, impacting the other inputs. Okay, so that's pretty seamless. Um, on their drawback, they're not standard. Okay, as of today, they're absolutely not standard in C plus plus twenty. Some of that is going to go through. Not exactly sure what, uh, but. Probably not range adapters. Why? Right. Anyone has an opinion on that? No? Okay. Um, they are, how can I say that, sophisticated um, in their implementation. Um, I'm not criticizing at all. I uh, actually really like that code. I uh, sometimes read that on a weekend to relax. Um, <laughs> but it's a little um, advanced in terms of uh, implementation. I think. And um, they don't really work with multiple outputs. They work with multiple inputs, but not really with multiple outputs. For example, taking our example of, um, of um, say, say either the, the three-part set things or even the partition copy right, that has several outputs. Imagine that you're doing a partition copy with two branches, um, output branches, and you'd like to um, apply a function on only one of, of the branch that comes out, can't really do that with the ranges adapters. They are they really live on the input side of things, which is not a bad thing, but it's not really their job to work on the output. Right, um, moving on to the output iterators. Well, they do work with multiple outputs. Right, like we saw with uh, Devnal and all of its siblings. Yeah. Um, they also they are in a privileged position to act on on the output data on the output container. Right, like think about map aggregator. Right, the the output iterator that would uh, take a function to aggregate data and would aggregate several values on the same key on a map. Um, this is not something you'd like to read in your code, is it? Right? Or that if, is it there? Is it get an iterator? Is it different from end? You don't want to read that. Um, and map aggregator encapsulate that quite nicely because it happens to be at the right position. Right? Uh, they're also composable. Uh, they're actually pipeable. I haven't seen, I haven't shown examples of that, but it's in the library if you want to have a look. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a matter of taste. Actually, who prefers um, the first syntax in Roo? Okay, who prefers the second one? Okay, that's a clear win for the second one. Um, and, well, the implementation fit on a slide, even for the DMUX thing, and that's <laughs> cheating, but... <laughs> <laughs> Fit on a slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but think about the other ones. Uh, well, the DMAX is, is 
full of template thing, but that's because of what it's doing. But conceptually, uh, they, they fit on the slide. They're, well, it's a, pre it's a pretty recent library, so it probably has bugs and design to be changed or whatever, but conceptually, it's pretty simple. We've got a question at the back. Yeah. And um, drawbacks of output iterators, uh, they're not standard mm -hmm. at all and haven't written it, but they don't work, work well with multiple inputs, right? It's like the symmetry of uh, range of So That was design. Now there's another thing that can make us choose between uh, ranges and output iterators. It's a terrible problem of incrementing the smart iterators. What is that? Okay, so we've got this lovely uh, situation where everything seems to go fine. Uh, we've got inputs, one, two, three, four, five. We pipe that through classical transform and filter, and looks really um, happy code. But at the moment where you expect it the least, something's going to go terribly wrong. So. Let's, let's see uh, what that code outputs. So what do we think it's going to output? So one, two, three, four, five is going to go through times two first, right? So that would be two, four, six, eight, ten. And then it's going to go through a filter of is multiple of four. So the multiple of four of two, four, six, eight, uh, yeah, two, four, six, eight, ten would be four and eight. Let's see what that code outputs. It outputs. For an eight. This is great, but you were expecting something would go wrong, and that happens when you don't expect it. Um, so let's put a trace here in the transform. Okay. So we expect the data one, two, three, four, five to go once through the transform, perhaps once through the filter. Yeah, once through the filter. And um, printing that code. The transform function is called more than once for some elements. And that's a problem. It actually um, caused the performance issue, and that's how I, uh, I came across it. Why? What's happening? Well, what's happening is, say that we are right in the middle of uh, the iteration. Uh, we're there, OK. Uh, We've just read the transform, uh, and then it's full, so it goes through the predicate. Okay, so it's time to move on. Uh, moving on. So let's say it's like std copy, for example. Moving on, we test that. Okay, so does it satisfy the predicate? It's not multiple of four. No. Moving on. Let's test that one. Satisfy the predicate? Yeah, it does. But to know that, we have to call function once. That's one time. Now, reading the value. We read the value, um, take full, send it to the function, send it to the predicate, and that's call the function a second time. And I'm calling that the terrible problem of incrementing a spot iterator because I have no idea how to fix it. It's reproduced in my ranges library, which I've made for experimenting. Uh, reproduced, I've reproduced it with the range v3, and I have no idea how to fix that. And that's, that's really a problem, because uh, you don't expect the function to be called several times there. Now, does the, do the um, smart output iterators, um, do they have the same problem? Well, um, so one of the application of um, like reading stuff was happening in, in the increment operator for the ranges. In our case, the increment operator doesn't do much, it just increments the operator, okay? Uh, an, an iterator, sorry. Um, so it looks like it's okay, all right? So let's test that. Let's run the code and uh, yeah, it's okay, cool. But then, it's not, it's not over. 
Um, let's, um, so, it, sorry, it just, yeah, going back. In that code, that's the equivalent of going through a, a transform times two and then multiple of four predicate. And that sends the data to back in SATA. What if we change that with begin? Should be okay, right? Oh, let's test that. We were expecting 4 and 8, and we're getting that bunch of zeros. It's because every time, uh, for every element, regardless of if it satisfies the predicate or not, we call plus plus and, and the, the, the output iterator forwards that plus plus to the underlying iterator, which is transformer, which forwards this to the begin, which does something. Right? Actually moves one step forward, whereas back in SERSA didn't do anything, doesn't care about the uh, being incremented. So let's fix that. Yeah, let's uh, just remove that, right? And uh, should be fine. No. Maybe, no? Yeah. Well, let's test that. Yeah. Not really. Yes. What we would like, really, is to increment only if it satisfies the predicate. So let's just write that. Okay. But is that okay? No. Well, perhaps not, because the plus plus doesn't do anything anymore. So if, if for some reason the algorithm calls plus plus twice in a row, right, um, it, it, it wouldn't move uh, begin two times just because of that. So maybe that's weird. However, it seems to be okay because algorithms are not supposed to call plus plus twice in a row. Okay, it's supposed to alternate between uh, assignment and, and plus plus, which is conceptually exactly what we want. So is it okay? I think so. I think so. Anyone seeing the problem? Is it what you were thinking about? I think I was thinking about the int that sometimes you might prevent it. Well, so far, it looks okay. Um, on that particular use case, it looks okay. Right now, um, comparing performance, runtime performance. So to compare uh, the execution time, I've used, um, used quickbench.com. So if you don't know it, quickbench.com is a quite handy website that um, uses the Google Benchmark API, but it packages it in a nice way so that you just write your code uh, on the left and it shows uh, how fast it run okay, with a Google Benchmark interface. So I've uh, sent th three use cases to quickbench.com to compare uh, applying a transform, either with the range uh, adapter or with the algorithm or with the output iterator. So the code is like for ranges, we've got a vector of stuff and we pipe it through a transform. For an algorithm, we call stood transform, and for output iterator, we call the output transformer. Right, so we've got three colors, blue, pink, and yellow on, on the graph, and this is what comes out. So on that website, quickbench.com, you can test on Clang and GCC with the various levels of optimization. So this is what it looks like. Um, of course, I can't guarantee it will be the same on your platform, blah, 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 disclaimer. Uh, but what it shows is that smart output iterators are not completely out of the picture. They like in the same ballpark as uh, the other ones, or better in some cases. Um, Can't read the, the, the scales. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, it's um, just proportion. I was just wondering how much faster the O3 is compared to O0. That's uh, what I was right, I, I don't think you can read that. I mean, if you could see the figures, I don't think they would show that. Um, um, not that use case, not just transformers, say filter first. So uh, for ranges, we would pipe through filter and then transform. For the algorithm, we would create an intermediary 
container. You transform on it, uh, sorry, uh, copy if on it, and then transform. And for the output iterator, we would um, have the output uh, uh, filter and the output transformer. So this is what comes out. Right, same sort of uh, observation. It's kind of in the same ballpark, really. A bit better sometimes. And last use case, uh, first transform and then filter. Um, so that's the code you'd expect. And that's what comes out. Flang TCC. All right. Um, so if you'd like to like summarize all that um, very broadly, one thing we can see is that it's not just the SC algorithms when it comes to manipulating collections in C++. It's a broader picture. Yeah, there's the input, there's the outputs, and we need to learn how to make a choice for a given case and uh, to write expressive code where, where to put the logic. Um, if you'd like to see the code, it's all up on GitHub, on my GitHub. Um, if you'd like to talk about that or the SCL or whatever really, available in the hall and for the people watching the video, you can find me, reach out to me on Twitter and connect. And um, if you're um, interested to read more about smart output iterators and uh, actually the STL and the expressive code in C++, uh, you can read me on Fluent C++ every Tuesday and Friday morning. Thank you. Now it's time for questions, feedbacks, comments, anything. <coughs> Forgot, yeah. What trivial little nit. Is there any time your test for something being a multiple of one is not going to be true? Well, yeah, well, that's interesting. Let's let's put that slide back up. Well, <laughs> the math answer is that no, it's always going to be true. Um, but that's a design option here. That's that's a slide we're thinking about, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, it's um. Well, if a number comes in and it satisfies a the predicate, then it's it just goes there and doesn't go forward. Okay. So the elements that actually reach that point are not multiple of three and not multiple of two. Yeah. You could say return true. Um, no, not really. It returns a branch, which is a private um, type that gets into the constructor on that, and this is the output iterator. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Um, can you scroll back to, to a couple to the code of one of your other smart output iterators? Um, there's a technique here that I think you that you would like that, that you did. That one's fun. Let's just show this out. Okay. Um, so you have um, you have this, you have these transform iterators. Basically, have a whole set of output iterators that do things when you look at a sign in the table. And you know, usually they have a container that they're putting stuff in. Right. Um, Sometimes you don't want to do that, but you want to do things at the end of a series of transactions, and you mm. turn it into the structure of the output iterator. Right. So an example is, you know, what's the fastest way to look stuff up, right, of a, of a fairly static set? You put them in a vector, you sort the vector, and then you do binary search. That's faster than a map because you've got cache locality. It's faster than a set and so on. Yeah. So if you have one of those, you have a smart output iterator that lets you put a bunch of stuff into the vector, and then when the output iterator goes away, it resorts the vector. Hmm. Cool, yeah. Okay, and so the vector is always sorted, except when you're in the Inserting. process of adding things. And you don't want to sort it after every in insertion, because that's wasteful. But you put 10 of them in and then resort. Yeah, that's a great case. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Alistair? Another observation, it's obvious, and it's an obvious thing I haven't discussed yet earlier, but filtering on output is very different to filtering on input. Mm -hmm. In more logic, if I just want to write out things that are prime out of the transformation, 
I, I can write out everything and then refilter the sequence I got, but doing it in one thing like this is really neat. So thank you. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Anyway. These are, these are, this is a lot of nice work. Cool. Thanks. Um, anyone? Question? Comment? Naughty comment? Reviews? Nice comment? Anything? Are you planning on following the reprogramming of the ranges? Because it would be nice to have some history of that stuff. Right. So how the, the pattern of the ranges work and then using some other ranges that you want to refer to sources? As in like transform and filter, that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah. yeah, that could make sense. It's not the case right now, but yeah, no. that could make sense, yeah, potentially. You could put it in some kind of uh, matrix of what you would use as like, you know, the output. Uh, right, like output, transform. Yeah, that's uh, sounds good, yeah. I, I do really like this. Yeah? At first I was like, but that's just a huge chunk of output. But now, yeah. if, once you've got the your actual stuff, Ben. It's, it's cool. It's very cool. Some of the testing is that um, there's a the, you can get the same you can get correct code by putting the transformers in sometimes in an arbitrary order, but the performance changes when the order changes. Like transform and then filter followed by filter and then transform on the output. They're they're both correct. They both produce the same output, but the performance is different. Oh, no. If you transform before you filter, you're filtering on a different piece of information. That yeah, was my point. Oh, it was really so neat that you can do the filter oh, on the end. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, I'm thinking of. Sorry, I'm thinking of an example from my head. It's <laughs> <laughs> all right. Imagine, imagine a transform and then a take n, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You get the same correctness either way around from that. Yeah, but not the same performance. So it's, it's not filter, but it's another. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a point. But the example you gave happened to be. Right, right. Yeah, so I'm just going to repeat the comments um, the video. So uh, Ben is saying that for some cases it would um, get to the same results um, for different orders of uh, adapters like transform and take n or take n and transform would lead to the same result, but one would do less work than the other one. Right, any other question, comments? All right then, thank you so much for coming.